Well, he brought us one of the most incredible works I've ever read about the subject of Egypt, the Giza Power Plant. And now Christopher Dunn has done it again with Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt. And when we are back, we are going to talk with him full program tonight about this. It's truly an, an incredible story. Christopher Dunn, next on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. Christopher Dunn has worked at every level of high-tech manufacturing. That includes being a machinist, toolmaker, programmer, operator of high-power industrial lasers, project engineer, laser operations manager. And Chris's Pyramid Odyssey began in 1977 after he read Peter Tompkins' book, Secrets of the Great Pyramid. And his reaction immediately after learning of the Great Pyramid's precision and design characteristics was to consider that this edifice may have had an original purpose that was a little different from conventional opinion. Discovering the purpose of this machine and documenting this case has taken the better part of 20 years of research, and here he is back on Coast to Coast AM. Christopher, how are you? I'm fine, George. How are you? Good. Nice to talk to you again. It's been so long, we could have built another pyramid by the time you came back. It's good to have you back. <laughs> uh, it's good to talk to you, too. Thanks you know, I, 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 I'm in St. Louis. I'm not too far from where you are right about now. Well, we're going to have to have dinner sometime. Absolutely. I'm here for about three more weeks, and then it's uh, heading back for uh, for Los Angeles. And by the way, you've done it again with this book, Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt. Uh, oh, thank uh, you. Just another home run, Chris, and uh, just great thank job. Great thank job. you very for, much. For a lot of new listeners who, who are just joining the program, uh, who are relatively new since you were last on with me uh, more than three years ago, let's go back a little bit. Uh, before we go forward, and tell us about the Giza power plant and your theories about that. That'll put a lot of this in perspective, I think, for everyone. Oh, sure. Well, the the Giza power plant uh, actually had its genesis in 1977 when I was reading Peter Tompkins' book, Secret of the Great Pyramid. And essentially, um, the information brought forward in that book was from a variety of people who questioned whether the Great Pyramid was actually originally a tomb. And they, they suggested other, other, other uh, purposes for it, such as an astronomical observatory, a granary, um, uh, other, other features, a geodetic marker, you know, a temple, but um, different, different uh, purposes than uh, actually a tomb. When I looked at it, though, and this was my first uh, experience of actually looking at the schematics of the inside of the Great Pyramid, the very, very unusual uh, shafts and, and chambers and little passageways, that it seemed to me that it really didn't make sense. Um, and so I, I, the tomb theory really didn't make sense. Uh, so I, I uh, examined it uh, further and... Uh, um, tried to make sense of uh, what I, I thought was the schematics of a machine. And one of the, the critical parts of the research of, of this particular machine that uh, is key to understanding it is its precision. And, of course, we're, uh, having worked w with pre precision all my life and manufacturing precision uh, and finding information about uh, an ancient edifice, a, a, a structure, that was built thousands of years ago that had the precision of a machine, except on a scale of acres, uh, really made me sit up and pay attention. <laughs> and so that I, uh, I then began to, uh, of course, formulate the idea that perhaps if uh, the ancient Egyptians were to put such a a uh, tremendous amount of resources into building this structure. Um, examining the structure in detail, you see that it's a highly sophisticated uh, assembly of, of limestone and granite, uh, precisely crafted within thousands of an inch in some cases, that, um, that the, uh, the engineers and the construction people, the craftspeople who cut the stone and put it together, were highly intelligent and were highly skilled. And so a civilization that exists that is so talented and so knowledgeable, would they actually support the building of such a structure when it's only to house a single body? Uh, it just didn't make sense. So 
if it was not a tomb, then mm -hmm. what is it? And the thought that I had was, well, obviously the people who built it, they wanted to, they were wanted something out of it. And, and normally our largest structures today uh, that we build are uh, power generating facilities. And and I I thought, well, maybe it was a power plant. And based on that premise, I began to examine it in greater detail and. And over many, many years, talking to different people, uh, physicists, engineers, elect electronics uh, technicians and engineers, uh, and chemical engineers, I finally formulated the theory, which is in the Giza power plant, that the Great Pyramid actually functioned as a holistic power plant device, mm -hmm. drawing energy from the Earth and converting it to electromagnetic energy in the form of microwaves that uh, exited the southern shaft of the king's chamber. Was it the shape, Christopher, of the pyramid that gave it that its ability to do that? I think the shape is very important. It's, uh, it, it, is, uh, it serves to be a, uh, an acoustical horn or antenna, and in fact it's a coupled oscillator to the earth. It's also um, seism seismically very stable. Uh, that 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 shape is very stable in that uh, you know any uh vibration uh, of the structure um uh, if the walls were vertical they would tend to uh be less stable than than the inclined walls of the of, of a pyramid so i think this shape uh, and also uh, whether the actual shape of the great pyramid and its and its unusual angle which is uh, 51 degrees, 51 minutes, uh, 40, 14 seconds, is actually the angle that you would have in a pyramid shape or structure that uh, would be, it would encoded the, the function of pi, which is 3.1415926. Amazing. Um, whereas the perimeter of the Great Pyramid has the same relationship to its height as the radius has to the circumference of a circle. So the, the pi factor is definitely in the Great Pyramid. Christopher, are you, are you a believer that the pyramids of Giza were constructed 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, maybe even farther back? I'm, I'm inclined to believe that the, the uh, pyramids and and temples in Egypt uh, were, were built earlier. Um, I, uh, it's, not, it's not fundamental or crucial to my work to have them placed in any particular epoch or any century. They could have been constructed 2,000 years ago. Uh, the evidence is, is, doesn't change. Uh, it just gets older. But the evidence is still the same. And and so as far as who built it, um, I I really don't have any strong opinion. What I would say though is that because of the because of the genius and the manufacturing uh, capabilities of the builders of the Great Pyramid and also the temples and statues in Egypt, because of their capabilities. And the clear evidence that they were using uh, mechanical, precise machines, or that the, they were they were crafting with mechanical precision, and must have had machinery because their evidence actually proves that, as outlined in Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt, that because the machines don't exist, we have to ask the question: Well, what happened to them? Yeah, uh, they haven't. I mean, if they do exist, they haven't been found. And so if they, if they can't be found uh, because they're not on the planet or they have eroded away over time, then the further back we go, the more reasonable it seems that w we can say that even uh, very large pieces of equipment that would not be stripped down and used for other purposes by surviving civilization um, would erode over time. That's uh, true. If they're made out of ferrous materials, like we make our, our machines out of ferrous materials, so um, there is that part of it too. If, so if I, in, 
I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, sir. sir. Ahead. If an architect today wanted to design the pyramids, what kind of, not for construction purposes, but for architectural purposes, what would he use today? I assume computers, computer graphics. Um, you know, he'd have his calculators with him. He'd have all these instruments to just, you know, outline and plot how this thing is going to be constructed. In in ancient Egypt, and we'll get into the uh, the lost technologies and the equipment, but I'm sure they had to have had architectural wonders there who plotted this stuff out, right? Oh, yes. I mean, uh, yes, they were... <laughs> They were very capable, and and one of the um, one of the problems that we have, though, and which I try to avoid in in writing the the uh, lost technologies of ancient Egypt, is that we can discuss what we have available today. But I think what we have to do is um, study the artifacts uh, and the results of their work, and just determine exactly what are the minimum requirements that uh, they would need. How far back in our history would we need to go to say, okay, at this point in our manufacturing history, uh, we have the capabilities to create these objects. And what, what I, or we had the, the technology and they had the knowledge of the geometry and precision to be able to create these. Now, you know, if we go back uh, even 40, 50 years, and we go back to the time of the slide rules in, on, in every engineer's pockets, um, the, the engineers of that day were, were very capable of, of, of designing a, a pyramid that looks, or would look exactly like the Great Pyramid in terms of the number of blocks, the shape of the blocks, the position of the blocks. The the only pr difficulty is uh, when you talk to construction engineers is actually putting the thing together, and right. then in a reasonable amount of time, because the um, uh, the quotation from a a, a modern quarry expert uh, said that it would take 27 years just just to quarry the stone to build the Great Pyramid without even putting it together. And there are some construction engineers that say that it's beyond our capabilities. Uh, I would rely on a construction engineer's opinion. But there I are a lot, of, a lot of theorists who believe it's, it's entirely possible. Well, you listen to Zahi Hawass, you had 100,000 people running around pulling these things and chopping away at them, and I, I just can't see that. Uh, I can't either. The <laughs> problem with <laughs> the problem with uh, the simplistic uh, viewpoint, the problem with with simple with simple solutions, uh, uh, is when they go to demonstrate those simple solutions, they the efforts are simple and primitive. So, in the shadow of the Great Pyramid that has seventy ton blocks of granite. You'll see demonstrations on documentaries where there are guys in in, in these little diapers or whatever they call them, hauling half-ton blocks up to up the up to the Giza plateau, and and they 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 say, well, that's the way they did it because you know they they didn't have the machinery, they didn't have the the wheel back then, and that we we have some tomb drawings that actually show. Uh, hundreds of Egyptians pulling on ropes on large statues, so they had to have uh, used those methods. But when you start to look in detail at, at what what is required just to cut the, the stone with the precision and to be able to do it efficiently, the methods that are described by Egyptologists really do not uh, explain the evidence on the ground. So it, it really it really needs um, a, a team of experts in different disciplines to fully understand and describe the uh, what what is necessary to build a, a great pyramid. A lot of people have tried, and you know, a lot of a lot of uh, theorists work things out well on paper, 
And having worked in the real world, uh, I know that whatever you describe on paper does not necessarily transfer uh, into the workplace. So it it is a huge, a huge problem. Christopher, can you outline for us the possibilities of who may have constructed these? And and, and I know that's not part of your theory of lost technologies of ancient Egypt, but uh, I'm, I'm sure you've probably have wrestled with this yourself, but you know, I would, I would have thought ancient Egyptians, another civilization, extraterrestrials. I mean, have you, how many are out there possible? Well, I've considered all of them. Um, I've, I've read pretty much all of them. Um, I think that there is a, uh, there is a problem when we try to, a political problem when we try to strip the, uh, the credit from the Egyptians and and assign it to another culture and and that seems to be rather a chauvinistic uh, stance where we say well the ancient Egypt the, the Egyptians were not, obviously weren't uh, capable of doing this uh, so it must have been another another civilization and right, right. they're very very skittish about people who will try to put the credit for the credit to uh, Atlanteans or aliens, um, and and even they they don't like. Uh, it seems to me they don't like to, uh, or at least the official Egyptologists in Egypt don't like to accept the notion that the ancient Egyptians used modern equipment, um, or that they were highly a highly advanced civilization. Yeah. That's a good point, and and I wonder why, because even taking the possibility then, the the large possibility that Egyptians constructed these uh, with incredible technology, which we'll get into, why would they kind of want to disassociate themselves from that? Um, I I, I, I will say that there are many uh, Egyptians who... Who, are, who welcome this this kind of um, credit to their civilization? And certainly, at lost technologies of ancient Egypt. I give the ancient Egyptians credit, and actually, I dedicate the book to the ancient to the Egyptians and their glorious heritage. So, um, it's recognition for it's recognition for what they actually did by by describing their work and uh, and putting credit where credits due, um, which means that. The conventional view on how the ancient Egyptians built the pyramids and temples and statues um, has to be revised. And I think where the political um, roadblocks are there is, is in the educational system. And the, uh, they're kind of vested in, this, in our, the Western view of history which does not include a highly advanced ancient Egypt. It, uh, you know, they don't consider the Egyptians more advanced than the Romans or the or the, right. or the, or the Greeks. So, uh, and the Egyptian Egyptologists are, are trained in uh, in the West. For instance, Dr. Zahi Hawass, he got his degree from the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah, that's right. So he was trained by uh, Western Egyptologists in his uh, in his thinking uh, profession, so yeah. uh, and there's a lot of money involved in it too. Oh, a- absolutely! And is it conceivable that this technology was not just in Egypt at that time, but might have been all over the planet at that time? Um, conceivable? I think it's actual. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's not just conceivable. See, I kind of I mean, like, tippy toe, Chris. Yeah, I know you did. <laughs> it's not like it's, it's not like we we have to ask the question because we don't know. We know it's it's all over the planet. All you have to do is travel to South America, and you can see it. A Puma Panko. I mean, that's uh, another incredible site that uh, okay. shows evidence of, of advanced technology. Hey, Christopher, we're going to take this break. We're going to come back and get into lost technologies of ancient Egypt next on Coast to Coast AM. If you are not a member yet of Streamlink, Coast Insiders, well, you can be for just pennies a day. Take care of your past archives and your downloads and your podcasting and your iPhone apps. And 
Again, I've been getting emails. When are you going to get the Android apps? How about the Blackberries? They're working on that. I was told several weeks ago it was around two months to go, so it's uh, it's getting close. And when I get back to L.A., I'll get a more pinpointed date for you on that as well. When we come back, more with Christopher Dunn as we talk about his incredible work, Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt, on Coast to Coast AM. Christopher, tell us about the evolution of lost technologies of ancient Egypt. How did uh, how did this happen for you? Well, the uh, the evolution of lost technologies um, really, I, I would go back to the 1986. Uh, I was at um, the Open Air Museum at Memphis, which is a few miles south of Cairo. Mm-hmm. And it struck me as odd that the, as I was looking down the length of the Ramses statue, um, that the left and right nostrils on, on his on the statue on the nose were identical mirror images to to each other. And it's my, always been my understanding, and certainly true in my case, that no adult has identical nostrils. So this uh, was significant to me at the time, and and it stayed with me for quite a while. Now, after the Giza power, of course, at that time in 1986, I was doing studies of the Great Pyramid. I was more interested in the engineering of the pyramids than I was on uh, statues or temples, and right. I really didn't travel south to the uh, to the temples at Luxor, Adenda, and other places in, in the south, southern Egypt. But I stayed around Giza and was studying the, the Great Pyramid and other pyramids. But the, um, that's, that kind of stayed with me. Um, then, after the Giza power plant was, was published, um, I entered into quite a, lot of, quite a few discussions about the theory of the Giza power plant and also some of the other information that I brought out in, in the book, particularly the crafting of hard igneous rock like granite and diorite. And I brought into the book uh, a, a chapter that was entitled Advanced Machining in Ancient Egypt. Uh, there was uh, discussion, there was debate. Uh, some people uh, disagreed with my conclusions. Other people thought they were interesting and, uh, and felt that further research needed to be done. Uh, but there were some, some people that actually thought that I'd gone too far with the Giza power plant theory and that the, uh, the evidence of advanced machining or uh, um, craftsmanship in ancient Egypt was more powerful a subject because the, the theory really could not be proven false or, or, or proven to be correct unless you, unless you actually build another pyramid right. uh, and demonstrate it. So the theory is, is just that. It's a theory. But the... Um, the the capabilities of the ancient Egyptians to craft hard igneous rock to a high order of precision and geometry. That is something that is factual and and, and it is very, very strong and powerful evidence. So yes. that really weighed into my decision to write uh, a book about simply the craftsmanship of the ancient Egyptians and the tools that they uh, would have used. Were you in awe with the craft, craftsmanship? Oh, George, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, a, a visit by an engineer, and I've known many engineers that have traveled to Egypt and gone to uh, and walked around the pyramids. Uh, I've taken engineers to Egypt and, and had discussions with them at the pyramids in the, in the north, at the temples in the south and further south at the unfinished obelisk. And it's always the engineers that uh, end up um, with a certain amount of humility and, and awe uh, about what the ancient Egyptians were able to accomplish. You walk through the, the, the temple at Luxor, and you walk in between two giant statues about 45 feet tall, weighing 600 tons, perfectly crafted. Um, and a, and a solid piece of granite, solid pieces of granite. And then over there the, uh, the, on the West Bank, you have the, the, uh, the, the Ramses statues, the Colossi of, Me- of Me- Mammon, and they are 
absolutely huge, about a thousand tons of weight each. And you see the way that the, they are cut and the the order of precision with which they are cut. It is it is awe inspiring. I, I'm always awed by it, as many other people are. The kind, I, no, so, sorry. No, the, the, go ahead. No, I want, want you to finish. Well, because I I always look at it from the point of view. Well, how would I, I how would I create something today? Um, and really, that is the cornerstone of the, of lost technologies of ancient Egypt, mm-hmm. and that is to throw the challenge out to whoever wishes to pick it, pick up the challenge, to throw throw the challenge out that. You know, we as lay people, we're not Egyptologists. I'm not an Egyptologist. I've uh, watched so many documentaries uh, by uh, different presenters, uh, with Egyptologists being involved and also other other uh, uh, disciplines, that try to teach us how the pyramids were built. And they demonstrate using the most simplest of tools but they never describe the most difficult aspects of the work, nor do they replicate the most difficult aspects of the work. So it was my intention to present uh, to the reader uh, the evidence that needs to be explained before we can before we can say, okay, I know how I know now how advanced the ancient Egyptians were. And it, it is stunning when when you look at the the full scope of the work, and particularly the the sta- statues. The statuary is simply amazing. And there is a, a YouTube video. It's on my website. I think it's on Coast to Coast from yeah, the yeah, now. Yeah. And essentially, that that little video is a little clip uh, shows the symmetry of the Ramses bust. At, uh, at Luxor, and to collect those images, I actually traveled to Egypt uh, three times uh, because I needed to get a, a, a digital photograph of the highest quality, but one that was dead center uh, to the center line of the, of the head of, of Ramses because I wanted to uh, test it for symmetry. In other words, check one side of the face to the other. Again, remembering the time when I was at Memphis and looking down the Ramsey statue and noticing the nostrils being identical, hmm. uh, I, I detected that not just the nostrils, the entire nose, the jawline, and the eyes were perfectly symmetrical one side to the other. Now, what does that mean in, from, in a manufacturing terms? Well, for precision, to demonstrate something as... as um, a, perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. Right? Yes, you have to have a measurement. You have to be able to measure it with a standard. And in the case of the Ramsey statue, the standard by which we measure the accuracy is one side of the face, and so we measure the other side of the face uh, against the opposite. And when we have a condition where both sides of the face are perfect, perfectly the same, then we know that we have something that was intentionally crafted with extreme precision. And that's what that uh, little video demonstrated. It also shows that they had a system of measure. They must have had some kind of geometric scheme, a protocol that they were using in order to transfer information from the designers to the craftspeople to the theorized machines that were necessary to actually control the tool as it cut the statue. And this geometry is amazing in and of itself in that it incorporates the uh, 345 triangle. Though the 345 triangle uh, was uh, first described by Pythagoras, it was known by the Egyptians, and they encoded it in the Ramsey statue. Well, the, the knowledge is incredible. Last week, I walked through one of these large hardware stores, and, you know, you see drills, and screwdrivers, and saws, and all these forms of equipment, all these kinds of things that are used to do things. Mm-hmm. And 
and, and just to marvel at lost technologies of ancient Egypt for a moment, Christopher, what kind of a what kind of tools did they have? They had to have them. Oh yeah, well obviously they had to, they had them all right. Um, one of the things that I did during my research for the book, I contacted a sculptor because I wanted to get the opinion of a, a modern sculptor to see, um, you know, what they what they thought about the, uh, the the ancient Egyptians' work and what it would take them to actually make it and whether they could make it with the the tools that are. Uh, are known to have been in the ancient Egyptian toolbox, or that we accept were uh, conventionally that were in their toolbox. And so I contacted Mike Leckie, who has a uh, is a very very talented sculptor, and he's you can actually see some of his work at uh, mikelecky.com. But Mike Leckie returned with a, a letter to me, and he said that he would have to upgrade all his tools, and he's using you know steel. <laughs> uh, car by chisels and he'd have to go to diamond and you know and even then he won't be able to do it he said he, he doesn't have enough time in his life to actually accomplish uh, that that kind of work because he works in uh, alabaster and marble uh, and the ancient egyptians were plowing through granite with right. uh, comparative ease so um, I, I take a modern sculptor's view, but also I have my own point of view, which is that of a manufacturing engineer and ex-tool maker and machinist. And, you know, the, the cutting tools that we use for granite would be diamond tools. They, uh, they cut very slow. There's also a method that you could use, such as impact machining, but you'd have to use. That's where the, the tool would peck at it at a very rapid rate, like an ultrasonic kind of uh, machining. Something like a dentist uses sometimes, too. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah, only on a much larger scale. You're absolutely right. right. And, and you know, NASA developed that one drill that they uh, they took to Mars to cut into hard rock, and that was an ultrasonic, little ultrasonic drill. But essentially, it just, it just eats into the, uh, a hard material like it's butter. Uh, so something like that uh, we could design and use today. Of course, you know, uh, uh, most uh, Egyptologists would choke on the idea that the ancient Egyptians may have had that kind of technology. And and so that's where the idea comes in that maybe we have to have to go further back and maybe these uh, artifacts were misassigned or, you know, incorrectly assigned to the ancient Egyptians and were created by an earlier culture. In that well, when you, when you think of tools, you then have to think of, because we're thinking beyond hammers and chisels, we're thinking of high, sophisticated tools, then you have to think of a power source for the tools. Exactly. What could, what could that have been? Um, well, you know, the power source for the tools, um, and this is where the Giza power plant comes in, not necessarily to say that the Giza power plant built itself because it was the power source for the tools to cut the stone to cut the power plant. It's like what came first, the chicken or the egg. But because um, it demonstrates that the ancient Egyptians had a sophisticated knowledge of science and technology and that they uh, had developed uh, a knowledge of electricity, they used it and were able to generate it. Um, of course, you know, the, uh, there's always the arguments. Well, okay, if that's the case, where are the wires? Where, you know, where are the uh, the Black and Decker drills? You know, we don't find any out there in the desert. So, you know, obviously the theory can't be right. But again, we have to say, oh, well, if we go far back in time, maybe we look for an extinction event, which would be 10,000 plus years ago. Um, then we can say over uh, an extended period of time, a lot of the materials that this advanced civilization had developed and were using would have been uh, adopted, uh, you know, machines would have been cannibalized, uh, artifacts would have been put to different purposes um, just for survival. And then eventually over time, they, they would have uh, rotted away. Uh, we look at, you look at a 
you know, an old Chevy in a ravine, an Indiana ravine that's been there for 20 years, and you know in a few hundred years that thing is not going to be up to much. So, the, uh, the you know, the everything goes back to the earth eventually. Fantastic. I mean, and, it's, it, it's almost as if they picked them up, the tools, took them with them somewhere, buried them. Who knows? Who knows? Well, you know, I, I kind of hope they did. George, because uh, eventually, if they did bury them and they survived, then gotta find maybe them. eventually somebody would find them. Yes. And then, the, you know, the, 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 the whole debate would be over. Here they are. But now what the debate is centered on is if you believe or anybody that comes forward and says they know how these artifacts were made, then they have to prove it. And if they think that the... The tools that are in the ancient Egyptian toolbox are, are capable of doing it, then they're absolutely wrong because to date they haven't been able to demonstrate that. Can, uh, uh, can any of these uh, artifacts have been grinded out by hand at all to the perfection that they are? There's obviously there is, I mean, in my, in my history, there has been a lot of handwork. I mean, during an apprenticeship that I served in England as a young lad, uh, we, had, we were taught the old-fashioned way on how to make things, and a lot of things that we made were by hand with precision. But associated with making things by hand with precision are the, the gauges to um, actually inspect the artifact that we're making and to make sure that we are uh, making it to the drawing which includes particular tolerances or dimensions within a certain precision or accuracy. So uh, even though things can be made by hand, um, there also has to be um, precision instruments to uh, inspect it. Now, drilling a hole in granite, uh, there are holes that we look at in, in granite in Egypt that you look at it and you say you couldn't do that by hand because the the, to, the tooling marks on the granite uh, prove that they that they were using some kind of a tube or a drill that was do, that was drilling through the granite at a high rate uh, high high feed rate. Similarly, if you go to Abu Rawash and you look at the a granite stone at Abu Rawash, you, you see that. They were cutting this, the, these, these stones with a very, very large diameter saws. And the, the uh, Abu Rawash stone that I describe in, in Lost Technologies, and which I actually have a, a, um, an abbreviated version on my website at geezerpower.com, um, under the article section, it's called Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt Adaptation, uh, where... Uh, your listeners can go read that article and look at some of the photographs. <clears throat> uh, this particular stone has a, a radius cut in it along a particular the length of it or the face of it, but that radius ends in another radius. So what you have is a, what they call a compound radius, which is created when a when a saw is at a, a circular saw is at an angle to to the the face of one of the radii. Or both of the radii. So the um, so the evidence on that stone and measuring the radius, which I was able to do by calculating, you know, by measuring the, the cord length and the, and the sadiga height or the, the cord height, um, the the evidence shows that the saw that cut that particular piece was over 37 feet in diameter. Oh my gosh! And that is incredible. Now. I mean, wrapping my wrapping my mind around that notion or that idea was was uh, quite lengthy. How how did they do it? I, I mean, it's just unbelievable. It's incredible information. Let's get into some of these various uh, statues when we come back. Well, can you imagine the advanced engineering that went into all of this? Up next, Christopher Dunn will chat more. And what's the significance of all of this? We'll find out when we come back on Coast to Coast AM. Let's talk a little bit about the white crowns of Upper Egypt and tell me about your interest in this. 
Well, the uh, the white crown of Upper Egypt um, can be seen on top of ancient Egyptian statues. It's also depicted in uh, Egyptian reliefs and uh, artwork. Um, the con it's a conical shaped crown, and it's known as the head yet, and it's, uh, it's sometimes combined with another crown called the Deshret, which is the crown of Lower Egypt, and combined they they are called the the Pshent. They symbolize the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. Uh, many statues uh, in, in Egypt can be seen with the crown sitting on top of the head of the pharaoh. And in the Ramses Hall at Luxor, several of these crowns had fallen and were placed in front of the statues that are situated in the hall. And uh, it was in 2004 when I first visited Luxor, and it was that night when the, the temple was lit up, so it was, uh, you know, quite an impressive sight. And the tour guide, the Egyptologist, was talking, was actually describing the reliefs on the walls, and my, the, the glint of granite actually caught my eye, and I went over to these uh, unusual granite objects, and, and they were actually the white, the white crown, or the conical crown of, um, of southern Egypt and the uh, or upper Egypt. They the interesting thing about the, these crowns and that these should be of interest to anyone who has a fascination for lost civilizations and Egypt in particular. But the granite conical crowns uh, were actually shaped like uh, they were ellipses. My my studies of them determined eventually that all the, all these conical crowns that are found on the hundreds of statues were crafted as ellipsoids. That in itself is very, very significant. And as I uh, illustrate in my book uh, use, uh, with the, the photographs that I had taken at Luxor, um, at Karnak, at the British Museum, um, the, uh, these crowns are all shaped like ellipses. And the ellipse or the ellipsoid is actually used, I mean, we use it in manufacturing uh, jet engine parts because the, uh, the tail cones or the inner hubs for some of the assemblies that we make are actually uh, designed as ellipsoids. Okay. And an ellipsoid is actually a solid. It's not a, an ellipse. Obviously, is a two-dimensional uh, shape, and um, and they can be they can be described on paper with a paper and pencil, uh, and there is a mathematical formula for them. Um, but the ancient Egyptians, they were not known to be uh, using ellipses, let alone crafting. Ellipsoids, which is a, the solid. It's like you take that ellipse and spin it in a lathe, and you have uh, an ellipsoid. The uh, the amazing thing about them was that it, they're not just uh, you know the, it's not just the the shape, but the feel of the of these crowns because they they were on the ground. I could actually run my hands over the surface. And I was very impressed with the feel of the craftsmanship because there were no dips, no bumps, no pits, or uh, any irregularity in the surface. It was just like uh, running my hands over some artifact or piece that had come out of a, a modern machine. And uh, the, the surfaces were that smooth and, and regular. Uh, but that was in 2004. I didn't have much time, and of course I was with the group, so I had to move on. And it wasn't until 2006 I signed up for a tour with John Anthony West, actually, and uh, I took some uh, digital camera with me for the, the express intention of actually taking photographs of these crowns and examining them in my computer. Because I was interested to, uh, to see if the, these uh, crowns, or one side of the crown, was equal to the other side. Um, and it was at in two thousand that time in two thousand six I took photographs of the the uh, Ramsey's head, which is outside the the, the uh, temple of Luxor. Uh, and, and could you see any kind of um uh, like mistakes or markings on them? Like you know, like someone if somebody was sculpturing these things out, um, you know, it had a groove line. 
You know, that's a very interesting question. At the time, uh, the, I, I didn't see anything on the on the crowns or the or the uh, the Ramsey's head. Um, the the crown was was about uh, just about perfect, uh, and uh, the smoothness of it, and also the geometry of it. Uh, when I examined it in my computer, and I describe it in my book, the the process that I went through. So, um, but going further with my investigation, I did start to detect. I did detect through. Uh, um, digital zoom uh, in my computer on on some of the Ramsey's faces uh, certain errors, what I would call mistakes. Uh, but I had to be sure uh, of what I was looking at, and so I had to go back with a better camera and with a optical zoom uh, in order to be able to pull that information out a little clearer. And uh, I went back in the actually the, my first visit in 2006 was in February, and uh, I came back and looked at what I had at, uh, in my computer, and I I went to my to the my boss, the CEO of the company, and I said, Judd, um, I would like to go back to Egypt. I need to go back to Egypt, and I. Just just used up some of my vacation time, and he wasn't ready for me to go back to Egypt. And he says, "Well, uh-huh. you just got back from Egypt. Why do you need to go back?" You know. And I said, "Well, uh, rather than explain it to you, <clears throat> I'll bring my laptop in tomorrow, and I'll show you why I need to go back." And so, uh, <clears throat> Judd is a, uh, a is a great guy. I mean, he's a very uh, brilliant man. Uh, actually, an attorney uh, by profession. But this has been the CEO of a manufacturing company for over 20 years, so he knows manufacturing very well too. And I brought my laptop in the, the following day, and I showed him the symmetry that I was uh, that was coming out of these photographs uh, with the of the statues, uh, the faces, and also on the crowns. And the way I demonstrated it was uh, the same way that you'd see in that video clip where I take uh, the original image, make a copy of it, I flip it horizontally to make a mirror image, and then I make it into a transparency and then bring it across the original to line up the features of the uh, of the geometry of the crown or the features of the face to determine what kind of uh, error uh, or difference there is between the two. Well, I went through the whole process with Judd looking over my shoulder, and at the end of about 15, 20 minutes, uh, he looked at me and he says, I see what you mean. You need to go. But I showed him another yeah. photograph, and I said, well, look, if I zoom in here, it appears that we what we have on this are, in it are tool marks, and I need to go back and not only to um, not only to optically zoom in on the, those those features to see if they're they really are tool marks, sure. um, but I also need to take better photographs, uh, more symmetrical photographs, uh, because the ones that I had taken were slightly off axis, so not all the features of the face lined up, and 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 also I showed him the the stone at Abu Rawash and uh, my analysis of the stone at Abu Rawash so he was very fascinated with that and he said yeah okay I see what you mean that's the one you were on uh, the same show I was on the the ancient aliens of the history channel right you were talking uh, about the, that on the evidence yes yeah. yes um I, I did talk about that. Uh, that is uh, what I consider to be a smoking gun. There are several people who have called it the new Rosetta Stone uh, because it, 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 it speaks volumes of the level of technology of the ancient Egyptians. Um, and, and so, you know, I got to show Judd uh, that particular artifact. And uh, in 2008, I, I took Dr. Arlen Andrews who actually used to work at the, uh, the White House Science Office uh, with me, and uh, he, uh, we went to Luxor, and I 
you know, I showed him the symmetry of the statues, the tool marks, and also the the stone at Abarowash. We went to up onto the Giza Plateau. I showed him several contoured blocks and the precision of the artifacts there. So, you know, it's been uh, pretty well witnessed by qualified individuals, uh, everything that I write about in my book. Christopher, do you think that the tools that were used for these statues were also used in addition to the the, the bigger uh, types of equipment for the uh, pyramids? Well, I think the, the knowledge. I mean, of it, in, in manufacturing, we we manufacture all all different kinds of products, and each uh, industry, a manufacturing industry, uh, will have. Uh, the machines to actually match what they're doing. For instance, the scale of the, of the machine tools in a, in a Boeing aircraft company um, at Everett, Washington, would be a lot larger than the scale of the machine tools at Danville Metal Stamping, where I work, because of the scale, the size of the, the pieces that they are they are working with. I mean, you know, the fuselage and the wing sections for an aircraft. Uh, uh, could be a uh, hundred to hundreds of feet long, whereas uh, the largest machine tool we have would be, you know, like a lathe with a uh, sixty-inch swing or something like that. So the, the, it depends on what kind of a manufacturing company you are and the size of your products. So if you transfer that to ancient Egypt and you see a variety of different products such as the statues in the south and the, and the pyramids uh, in the north and you see uh, the evidence of machine tools uh, at Abu Rawash we see evidence of uh, circular saws uh, of 37 feet in diameter and uh, that's huge. I mean, that's larger than anybody has detected before. Uh, William Flinders Petrie wrote in his book, William, uh, Pyramids and Temples of Giza, in 1883, that the ancient Egyptians were using circular saws. But uh, he didn't really describe uh, any saws of that particular magnitude. Uh, but, you know, they when you consider it, and you look at the scale of the work, the the, the immense size uh, and, and scope of the work of, uh, of the project of building just one pyramid, let alone the nine pyramids that you find on the Giza Plateau. But when you when you look at the scope of the work and you see uh, and the logistics of delivering a very very precise stone uh, to the site on time. Uh, you know, very quickly, in order to uh, build a structure that is aligned within three minutes of a degree of true north, and the the outer outer casing stones were fitted within ten thousandths of an inch, and also had an angle of on all four sides that were, were within two minutes of a degree of each other. That is an incredible achievement and required sophisticated tooling, in my opinion, to do it. And we have the evidence now at Abu Rawash, uh that shows that they were doing it in a very efficient way. As I say in my book, you know, or for the, to the ancient Egyptians, obviously, when you look at their works, size really mattered. And it mattered not only to their, their structures, but also to the tools. And to think that brilliant engineers like the ancient Egyptians who were able to conceive of and build the Great Pyramid and the temples and statues couldn't improve their tools over a 3,000-year period. That is the, the biggest mystery to me, is that we have accepted for so long that the ancient Egyptian civilization lasted that long without improving their tools yeah. at all. That's I mean, true. they started off using copper chisels, stone balls, and wooden hammers, and about 3,000 years later, they're using the same stuff. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. No. Tell me a bit about the obelisks that you've looked at. Um, they're all over Egypt, and tell me about the machinery for that. The obelisks are fascinating. Um, I mean, just the... 
just the, the the standing obelisk that you see at Luxor, um, and uh, a car, you know, the temple at Karnak. There are two obelisks there, and there's one now standing at at Luxor. There's uh, others around the world and and in Egypt. But the obelisks themselves are single pieces of granite. The heaviest ones that we know of were actually hauled up, or the finished ones were hauled up by the Romans. Um, and those weighed about 550 tons. The, uh, there is one obelisk that they were working on at Aswan that, that never left the quarry, and it's estimated to, when finished, it would have weighed about 1,200 tons. So actually examining the finished obelisks and also the unfinished obelisks, you have the full range of disciplines or techniques or uh, technology uh, that is involved in quarrying, cutting, finishing, and uh, precisely carving deep, beautiful three-dimensional reliefs in the surface of the obelisk, which you which you find on on the the ones that uh, Karnak and Luxor. But you, if starting at the Aswan quarry where they were quarried, uh, you see that the, this trench there is a trench cut around around the uh, the shape of the obelisk, and the trench is about 13 feet deep, and there are shafts that are drilled into the bedrock even further. And the uh, implications are that the, the marks on the side of the the block, and, and also the, the the raw bedrock, the, it appears as though they were using a tool that plunged into the bedrock and then was retrieved and then to clear out material and then plunged down again. Because what you see are vertical striations along the surface of the, the granite and also intermittently horizontal striations. And th this is really the hallmark of, of machining. Uh, and I, sh I actually show in my book a a sample of um, something being cut in a modern milling machine. Uh, not not any not any differently than it would be uh, on a daily basis, uh, but simply with a tool plunging down, being being uh, retrieved, and then plunging down again, and you come up with the same marks or uh, vertical striations and horizontal striations similar. To uh, on the the unfinished obelisk, so it's been a, a huge uh, debate for a long time was how these how the ancient Egyptians cut their obelisk, and I've been involved in that debate and I've published on that on my opinion on it because using um, constraint analysis, uh, it's not possible to cut one of those obelisks using the uh, conventional Egyptologist theory, such as using a stone ball with hundreds of workers just chipping away, bang, 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 on a, on a ten hours a day. Oh yeah. Exactly. And and when when, uh, when when the time that they were supposedly quarried was seven months, and it would take years using, you know, with one one worker at a work in a particular patch and removing X amount of material over a certain period of time. Um, there's not enough time in seven months to actually perform the work. So it, it seems like a uh, it's a theory that doesn't really hold up. And I address that in, in Chapter 9 of my book. I have an entire chapter on the unfinished obelisk and also looking at some of the finished obelisks and the beautiful craft work that we, we see in them. Christopher, when we come back, I want to ask you basically – the $64,000 question that if high technology, lost technology, constructed all these, what does that mean? What does that mean to us today? What did that mean then? Christopher Dunn, our special guest, his website, the thegizapower.com, linked up at coasttocoastam.com. And also get up to our website and take a look at the YouTube feature video he sent us, and we've got that all linked up too. Truly remarkable story. Lost technologies of ancient Egypt. More to talk with Christopher Dunn about when we come back next hour. We'll take your phone calls with him right here on Coast to Coast AM.
Christopher, let's accept your theories as fact that the the ancient Egyptians possessed incredible lost technology. What does that mean to us? Tell me the significance of all of this. Well, I think there's uh, a tremendous significance to our awareness um, in terms of our cultural filters. Uh, our, when we look, when we look at the past and we we examine how we have looked at other cultures and some of the uh, the chauvinism that we that have been has been kind of uh, practiced by uh, explorers or invaders of other of other other nations. If we look at uh, the ancient Egyptians and we see, wait a minute, you know. Uh, there are other cultures that can develop a tremendous level, high level of technology, and we in the, the West are not the not the first to actually do that. <clears throat> now, the other thing is uh, to, that, that for me is is, is a quite uh, humbling and, and a powerful realization is that the civilizations really are uh, immortal they're not we're not immortal and civilizations can rise and fall and that uh, what has happened in the past can happen again and so we you know it's kind of like a it's a humbling realization when you think you know it could all end uh, just like it did for the uh, ancient Egyptians or Comitians and and so I think that realization um, uh, is it more on a personal level, on a uh, on a on a, on a com community level, uh, you know, or for what we can learn, there there may be technologies or techniques that we we can actually develop by by studying the ancient Egyptians' methods uh, closely, or trying to determine what they were, because I don't think even some of the technologies that we have today. Uh, we're, we're not sure that they are capable of, of actually replicating what the ancient Egyptians did. So there's something to be learned there, I believe. Well, we we, we know in in ancient texts in India, for example, as they talk about the vimanas, flying machines, and things. I, I I have a feeling this planet had incredible technology. And then when you tie in people like Michael Cremo, who, by the way, wrote a little clip for you on the back cover. Of your yes, yes. You know, where he says civilizations were sophisticated and millions of years older than we think. I have a sneaky suspicion that this planet, for some reason, might have had civilizations 10, 20 million years ago, and they're just gone now. And well, yeah, we don't know. And, you know, the, the thing is, is uh, there have been some wonderful uh, avant-garde very brave researchers like Michael Cremo, like Stephen Mailer, Robert Schock, and others, Graham Hancock, Robert Baval, who have <clears throat> looked at um, the ancient artifacts uh, in, a, in a different, with, with a different light and a different, with a different eye, if you will, and they see something a little different than what the, the conventional uh, history books tell us, and they've been criticised very soundly for it, uh, myself included. I mean, the most uh, new, new age, they call it, they, they say, become a pejorative term, I think, with uh, archaeologists and, and egyptologists that new age researchers or uh, revisionist historians <clears throat> are, are pretty much dismissed. And as you mentioned, Michael Cremo, who has uh, been a pioneer in these studies, um, wrote a wonderful endorsement for my book, and and so did Robert Schock, and, and so did uh, Stephen Mailer and Robert Boval, and and several others uh, have been very very kind. J J Hertak is another one. John sure. DeSalvo. I mean, you've had them all on your program. Oh yes. But but this book uh, actually supports their work. Uh, that, that is not in competition with any of their views. I mean, they all have a, a different spin on it, and, and that that is great. It, we need to actually examine all ideas, not 
not dismiss them out of hand, but to actually say, well, you know, that's a that, that's interesting. Let's examine that. And the, the lost technologies actually puts information in their hand that they can say, well, here's the evidence. I mean, we have we have looked for evidence, really powerful evidence for a lost civilization or a civilization that was more advanced or you know a, a, a history that we even our intuition tells us uh, that we, 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 we don't know the full story. And out-of-place artifacts and unusual artifacts give us a, a rise, the, you know, the, the suspicion that the story that, we, we're, that are, is in the history books is, is patently wrong. And the Lost Technologies actually gives a fairly mainstream account of uh, manufacturing capabilities, and it, it, uh, it proves uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have not been taught the, the truth about how these artifacts were created. So there is another story to be told. And that's uh, another question, Christopher, because there's a reason we haven't been told this. I would, I would, let's make an assumption they know this already. They know that there was lost technology. Why don't they just come come out and say, mankind was here a long time ago. Uh, there were uh, catastrophes that obliterated them and the, and the planet. And, uh, you know, but that's just the way it was. Are they afraid that they're going to lose control of us? Are they afraid that, you know, we may all think, oh, my God, it's going to happen to us again? Um, why don't they just come clean? Well, um, I'm not sure that they know uh what uh, we're talking about I, I i think that they have heard it i don't think that they believe that um the ancient egyptians were more advanced I, they know that they were very advanced but they accept the uh the, the story that's been handed down o over a hundred years that they were, were fairly primitive with their, their tools but with the primitive tools they did marvelous things so um, I'm not so sure that there is a grand conspiracy to suppress the information, and I would hope uh, that they would pick up the lost technologies, read it, and accept the challenge to um, come up with better evidence to support their theories. Because after all, they are in the position, they, they are receiving their salaries uh, from their universities and, uh, you know, the, those who fund their chairs uh, and fund their research in Egypt. But they, they're the ones who are doing this for a living. I, I, it's, for me, it's just a hobby. So what I would hope is that they accept the challenge and and explain to folks like, like myself um, how these objects were made. For instance, my company... Uh, a manufacturing any manufacturing company if if a customer comes to us with a a product a physical product and puts it in our hands and says i want you to make something exactly like this make this for us what we would have to do is we would have to determine exactly what it is and describe it in great detail take measurements you know what the material was have an understanding of its function and then determine what processes we need what tools we need machines we needed to actually make it and then you quote them a price, right? And then we quote them a price. So that exercise, which is really the scientific method when you consider it, that to you, you describe an experiment, you collect data, you describe the data, you describe your, the, your experiment on actually replicating it, uh, and then you do it, and then you compare the results with the original. And that is not done. By Egyptologists, they they will take a um, a stone chisel and they'll chisel some limestone and say, hey, because I can chisel this little relief in limestone, then that's the way the Egyptians built their marvelous civilization. But they they don't describe the work accurately, and then they don't go back and compare their work with the original. Because if they did, they, you would see that it doesn't match. Well, that, that's true too. How will we find out beyond your work? Is there anybody else doing this, this kind of work? Um, there are very, some very uh, 
uh, vigorous researchers looking at the same kind of information that I'm looking at. Um, I'm not aware of any any works, any uh, published works out there of the same nature. I know that there is a tremendous interest in this kind of research um, all over the world. I mean, there is a, a Russian a uh, website devoted to this kind of uh, research where they look at the, the tool marks. They're looking at the holes drilled in diorite and granite at Giza, at uh, Abu Sur, uh, Abu Ruwash. And, and they also uh, are, are looking at, you know, uh, the, 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 the finish on, the finish in geometry of, of some of the, the stone, uh, the granite that you find at Giza and elsewhere in Egypt. So th there is a tremendous interest in this kind of uh, study. And to, uh, almost universally, they are, are, are rejecting the conventional view of using uh, primitive tools uh, to create these artifacts. They know that something else was going on back then. Christopher, uh, I, and I know what I want to talk to you about, too. I almost forgot to talk to you about the... the uh, some, you did some work at uh, Dendera, or you've looked into that, that... The, some of these uh, things oh. look like light bulbs. Well, actually, you know, I um, I introduced that in, in the Giza power plant, which was in the it's in the crypts uh, at, De at the Temple of Dender, and that's a very interesting story because uh, in 2006, when I went with with my with Judd, um, we went to Dender, and I went specifically to spend some time in the crypts for uh, examining those reliefs that look like uh, light bulbs. In fact, I, I think uh, Eric von Daniken had an electrical engineer uh, recreate one uh, after the design of, of the, the reliefs on the, mm -hmm. on the crypt walls, uh, and, it, and it worked. Um, I described them as a, a crux tube in the Giza power plant. They, they have the same, the same shape, but it's a cathode ray tube. Uh, but the... Uh, when I went there, I went on a Sunday afternoon, and it was uh, just a brief visit with the uh, the afternoon convoy. <clears throat> and uh, we met a wonderful temple guard called Muhammad, and he was just a real gentleman. And he had the you know the the sweetest spirit, the kindest eyes that you ever looked in. And he he saw that I was very interested in in uh, doing a study there, and. And so he said, well, if you want to come back and spend more time, come with the morning convoy and then leave after the, with the afternoon convoy. So in that way, you're able to spend about six hours. Um, and come on Tuesday because that's when I will be here and I'll take care of you. And so we came back on the Tuesday. I brought my camera and, and tripod and other equipment, and, and we... Uh, I, went, I spent about an, an hour and a half in the crypts photographing every relief on the walls. But then I went into the hyperstyle hall, and I, I had noted uh, on my uh, in the images that I'd taken on the Sunday when I was looking at them in the, in the computer, mm -hmm. but the hyperstyle hall in Denver seemed to be um, seemed to have a, an extraordinary precise kind of finish if you kind of look through it's it's heavily damaged it's been ravaged by time and and vandalism um, but the hyperstyle hall actually caught my attention and distracted me from the the crypts because i i spent like i say i spent an hour and a half in the crypts but i spent four and a half hours in the in the hyperstyle hall taking photographs and what i was examining was the um, the columns and the alignment of the columns and the amazing thing about these columns in the hyperstyle hall at Dendra is that each one of them has the face of Hathor described on all four sides and the the face of Hathor the, the Egyptian goddess has and Hathor by the way was the uh, was the goddess of love uh, drunkenness, sex, uh, but she was also the goddess of destruction. So 
It was kind of like a Saturday night, Sunday morning kind of affair with Hathor, I think. But the uh, she, uh, her face had been ravaged, and every, every image on on the columns, on these on these, on, on the capitals on the columns had been destroyed, so that the face was obliterated. But there were features still on these capitals that were that were remarkably precise looking. And so I took some close-up photographs. I also uh, took some photographs from a distance. The columns are about 50 feet high. The, the ceiling's about 60 feet tall. The, the capitals are about uh, between 50 and 60 feet tall. They're about seven feet in diameter, the columns. So they're, they're extremely large. There's uh, 24 of them in the hyperstyle hall. And I was able to take photographs of sections of the uh, uh, of the, the columns where I would have two, four columns in a photograph, or six columns in a photograph. But my camera was pointing directly up and square to to the uh, architrave above. And what I found out in my graphics program when I was examining the columns that there were features of the columns that were perfectly in alignment from one capital to the next. And these were uh, actually three points in three-dimensional space where you have three surfaces coming together, uh, two flat surfaces and a radial surface that actually meets uh, on one side of Hathor's cowl or headdress. And there's two of those points on each capital, or each side of capital, and the alignment between those points from one side to the other was spot on. It was perfect, but not just on the one column. You go over to another column, and it lined up with those two. Uh, all the features were in alignment. The corniche, there are two corniches on, the, on these capitals. Those are in perfect alignment, and there are other features like the cowl or the tresses that come down and end at the top of the column are crafted to end uh, the shape as an ellipse. So here at Dendera, you have another ellipse in the, in the uh, capitals uh, of uh, the Dendera Hyperstyle Hall. They're, they're absolutely amazing, and I, I, I actually showed uh, shown these photographs t to architects, and uh, I was I gave a pre presentation in Paris in March of this year at the Giza for Humanity con conference, and there was an architect in the audience, and and he uh, he actually wrote a uh, an endorsement for my book. His name was Alain Hubrecht, and he's from uh, Belgium. So it, it was um, the alignments, and even having those alignments uh, so precise after thousands of years uh, is mind-boggling. But just the, the work involved, because, uh, you know, the conventional theory of how these how these temples were constructed was that they would pile up these blocks, so drag them up a mud ramp, and uh, and then pile them up and then start from the top and start chiseling their way down and come up with the perfection that we see today. But the evidence there is, um, as I, I write in Lost Technologies, there is evidence and there's photog there are detailed photographs in the book, some color plates, some not. But the, uh, but the detailed photographs show that they would have crafted all the elements that go into create, crafting the columns and the capitals above um, before they actually assembled them. And it's, uh, it's quite <laughs> the, the Dendera Temple is an amazing place to be. It's a magical place to be. Well, Matt, yeah, I'm telling you, you've done magical work here, Christopher, with Lost Technologies. Next hour, we'll open up the phone lines, final hour with Christopher Dunn. You can talk to him about this work, Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt, and also the Giza Power Plant. Back in a moment on Coast to Coast AM.